today's lesson entitled The Source of Islam. We'll be talking about Islam and its sources in a few moments. Let's do a little review. In chapters 18 and 19 of Genesis, we saw a comparison of the type of faith that both Abraham and Lot, his nephew, had. And we said that Abraham's faith, although it had its ups and downs, had a certain direction, didn't it? I mean, you could see improvement as he progressed in his faith. He accompanied, or rather accomplished, certain things in the name of God through his faith. You know, I keep coming back to the defeat of the northern kings. He had 300 men, and these were five chiefs, five kings that he was chasing in their armies, and they defeated these. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of description about the battle, but it, you know, it must have been a fierce battle. And so through faith in God, he was able to defeat, to, uh, defeat these uh, northern kings who had kidnapped his nephew and, 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 and the goods and the people and so on and so forth. He won a great victory. And then you see him uh, as his faith moves him to glorify God with his work, to save others, to save others through his prayer. Last time we, we, we examined his uh, intercessor, uh, intercessory prayer. I'm having trouble with that word today, his uh, intercession on behalf of, uh, of, of Lot in his prayer. Um, you know, these are all maturing qualities that we see in Abraham as he progresses in his faith. And of course, the result of Abraham's faith was that God answered his prayers and blessed his life and considered him righteous, right? He was saved, he was considered righteous because of his faith in God. Now, Lot's faith was different. His faith was real, just as real, but he compromised with the world. You know, he, he, he first, you know, when he first wanted to live in the valley where it was, uh, you know, the farmland was there and, 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 and the, there was a lot of grazing, a lot of grass for his animals, so on and so forth. Uh, he, he, he lived in the valley and then pretty soon he lived in the city. And then later on we see he's not just living in the city, but he's one of the leaders of the city. You know, he's sitting at the, at the gate. And so there was a compromise there and we, we could read between the lines, right? That his wife was not very strong in her faith to the extent that she you know, was turned into a pillar of salt when she looked back longingly at, they were, at what they were leaving behind. Uh, we also see that he was not even able to convince his own children, all of them anyways, to, to leave and to save themselves. And so his, his compromise with the world uh, weakened his ability to witness, his, his ability and effectiveness to teach his, uh, teef, teef, uh, teach his uh, children. Uh, we see that he makes no great progress spiritually. Uh, we don't read of anything he accomplished uh, for the Lord. And in the end, he loses everything, right? His home, part of his family, everything. He's, he's in a cave, you know, living uh, with his two daughters. And then they become pregnant by him to at least keep the, the, family, line, um, the family line going. So these chapters demonstrated that our lifelong relationship of faith with God um, includes not only Him forgiving us and being patient with our failures, it also includes faith and service and trust and progress as we move forward, right? As we move forward in our faith and in our service, in our ability to understand spiritual things, in our ability to overcome temptation. All right, so Next couple of chapters, uh, we continue the story of Abraham's walk with God, and uh, it, begins with, uh, it begins with failure. This is in uh, chapter 20. So, after the Lord and the angels visited Abraham to tell him that Sarah would conceive, and then later they left to, to go uh, you know, destroy Sodom, Abraham leaves for a trip to the capital city of the land of the Philistines, uh, which is near the Egyptian border. Why he does this? He doesn't get any instructions from God to do this, to, as far as we know. Maybe the destruction of the cities near him caused some economic hardships in the area. 
and he needed to open up new trade and other business dealings there. Eventually, he ends up living in this area because Abraham you know, basically is a nomad, right? He is a tent dweller. And so it's not the end of the world for him to kind of pack up his tents and move you know, where, the, uh, where the harvest, where there's food, where there's uh, adequate uh, grazing land for his animals and so on and so forth. So he moves to this, to this area. Uh, he was a chief, right, a chieftain, and had to support a very large household. And so this may have been the reason and the nature of this trip. Anyways, in verses one and two, we read that, that he and Sarah used the exact same lie that they told in Egypt way back when for the same purpose. He is afraid because of her beauty that uh, she will be taken away from him. Um, she was, now think about this for a second. She was 90 years old at the time. And in order to conceive, God you know, may have rejuvenated her that she, you know, she might have been in danger. You know, God gave Abraham and Sarah the ability to conceive a child. Well, the, the, to conceive a child requires to have sexual relations. To have sexual relations there, there requires desire, energy, and so on and so forth. So nothing says that God did not rejuvenate them to be able to have this child. And as I mentioned in my last lesson, Abraham was able to have more children uh, with uh, another wife after, uh, Sarah, after Sarah died. Anyways, the story is they used the same deceit in order to protect themselves. So we see that King Abimelech, uh, which actually Abimelech, like a title, like Pharaoh, uh, this king took Sarah into his harem in order to be his wife. Now, it could have been because there was sexual desire. It could also have been the desire to form an alliance with a powerful chieftain like Abraham. I mean, they did this in those times. Uh, you would take someone's sister or daughter or some you know, relative in order to create family alliances, peace alliances, trade alliances, so on and so forth. So that could have been the reason as well. In the uh, ensuing verses, we see that God deals with Abimelech. And again, I'm not going to read all the passages here. We have some other passages that we want to read, but I'll just kind of tell you the story. First of all, uh, God inflicts a serious disease on Abimelech's household and possibly his entire nation where they couldn't produce children. And then he, permits, uh, he prevents Abimelech himself from having sex with Sarah and warns him that if he does, he'll die. And then he tells him who Abraham is and tells him that if he releases Sarah, Abraham, who is a prophet, will pray for him and that prayer will restore the health to his household and his nation. Now, um, um, we also see um, what Abimelech says to Abraham. First of all, he rebukes Abraham for deceiving him and jeopardizing the safety of the nation. We don't blame him there, right? He was a more righteous man than, than Abraham was at that point. He also rebukes Sarah and tells her that the covering that she needs is her husband, and that will be enough to protect her from the desire of other men. She doesn't have to lie. You know, he was a great chief. He had men and power and so on and so forth, prestige. He was an honorable man that she was his wife would have been enough to protect her from him. And I think maybe Abimelech was saying, what kind of man do you think I am to take another man's wife? Again, we see in this scene here, the, the king was more righteous in his uh, attitude here than, uh, than was uh, Abraham. And then finally, uh, like the Pharaoh, he gives Abraham money and livestock and the freedom to live anywhere in his land. Abraham uh, accepts all of this in order uh, certainly not to offend the king any further. So Abraham, for his part, explains his conduct to the king and then he accepts the rebuke because of the lie uh, and also accepts the gifts offered him. So this is the last chapter containing information on Abraham before the birth of Isaac, which begins a new period in the life of Abraham. Last chapter. So now let's talk about the child of promise. Let's go to Chapter 21, we will read uh, in this particular chapter in a few moments. Uh, let me just set this up for you. Chapter 21 begins by describing the time of the birth of Isaac. 
Uh, the word of God stresses that he was born according to God's promise. God had made this promise to Abraham that he himself would have a son even though his wife was barren, number one, and then not only was she barren, she was way past childbearing age as he was, but God made a promise and God fulfilled his promise. The fact that Abraham, as I said, was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 did not limit the promise. When God promises, he also enables. That's an important thing. Sarah was able to nurse her son, for example. Abraham, Abraham was able to conceive with her, and as I mentioned, he had six other sons with his other wife, Keturah, after Sarah died. So God just didn't give him his virility, his youthful virility, just for one occasion in order to conceive you know, Isaac. Apparently, he stayed that way, healthy, virile, able to produce children long after Sarah, uh, Sarah died. Uh, the point here, of course, is that man's weakness cannot stop the fulfillment of God's promise. As was the custom of the time, when Isaac was weaned, Abraham made a feast uh, for his household and the guests. So we're going to look at that part by reading now, picking up the reading in chapter 21, beginning in verse 9. It says, Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants will be uh, named. And the son of the maid I will make a nation also, because he is your descendant. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, I want you to note the old uh, that the old jealousy springs up and once again, Hagar is sent away with her child. God promises to care for her, the woman and the child, but the promise of the seed was to come through Isaac. This is the key passage that is debated among you know, Christian scholars and uh, Muslim scholars. You know, Muslim scholars say, well, the Bible has been corrupted, and that's not really what it says, and so you know, the, the Koran is the correction of the Bible. But if you accept that the Bible is not in error, that it, is, it has not been corrupted, what we have is you know, the Old Testament that we have today, that, are, that we're reading today, is in fact the Old Testament that they were reading you know, uh, two, three thousand, well, yeah, three thousand years ago, 2,500, you know, 500 years before Christ, 400 years before Christ, they were reading the same Old Testament that we're reading. The, the Jesus was referring to the body of literature, the body of writing, shall we say, not literature, but writing, the body of writing, uh, as the, as the uh, we call it the Old Testament, he would refer to it as the word of God, the scriptures, you know. Well, he was referring to the very same scriptures that we read when we read the Old Testament. Uh, Muslims say, no, no, the, something originally was written, but it has been corrupted, and the Quran is the correction uh, of that. So uh, just, just pointing to that passage and saying, okay, we're right, doesn't end the argument uh, with, uh, with a Muslim, because they don't accept the text that we are using anyways. But, According to Genesis, uh, it's very clear here that the promise, the seed of promise, is going to come through Isaac. And later on, as we continue on through the Bible, you know, God continually refers to the seed of promise you know, when to uh, Jacob and Esau. You know, we know that it's going to come through Jacob and not Esau. So there's always a choice uh, between which individual the seed of promise uh, will be uh, coming through. Note also that this is the first time, but not the last time, that Abraham has to give up a child that he loves. He loves his child, right? He loves his child. The first child born to him through Hagar, that's his son. 
right? That's his son, but he has to send him away. And we will know in the future that he will also have to sacrifice Isaac. So let's keep reading verse 15. It says, when the water in the skin was used up, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him about a bow shot away, for she said, do not let me see the boy die. And she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. God heard the lad crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave, a lad, gave the lad a drink. God was with the lad and he grew and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So she is put into the wilderness with only a little bit of food and water, perhaps so that she would learn quickly to trust in God. Soon they are lost and Hagar cries out to God for help and God provides a well and safety. In one verse, the Bible summarizes how Ishmael became a hunter and how he married an Egyptian woman selected by, remember, Hagar also was an Egyptian woman. She had been taken from Egypt. She was, the, she was Sarah's maid, so it's normal that she would go find a wife from her country, Egypt. In Genesis 25, we find out that um, Ishmael uh, had 12 sons and became a great nation just as God had promised. Now there's some interesting points about this particular section. First of all, the Muslim religion traces its cultural source to Hagar and Ishmael, just like the Jewish one traces back to Isaac and Abraham. Some people ask, you know, well, I hear the word Muslim, you know, M-U-S-L-I-M, L-I-M, and Moslem, you know, and what's the, what's the, um, what's the difference here? Um, and, and the word Moslem is the anglicized version of the word Muslim, which refers to a true believer. A Muslim is a true believer, a follower of the religion of Islam, and the term Islam means surrender. Okay. So know that this is the, these are the individuals um, that the Muslim religion uh, finds its source in. Also, the rivalry described in this ancient text uh, continues today, doesn't it? We see that all the time, as the Muslim world and the Jewish nation are continually at odds and at war with one another, and Muslims are at war with one another, as various religious sects within Islam, fighting each other to the death, right, for control, most of that uh, uh, war is about determining who is the legitimate heir of the, of the authority of Muhammad. Okay, after he died, there began to be a dispute as to who would uh, take on his mantle of authority over the Muslim world. And that war you know, between the Shiites and the Sunnis and so on and so forth, that continues to this day. Uh, also, the Muslim religion has ceremonies done today that date back to this very event here, you know, where she's in the desert and she's crying and she goes back and forth. Uh, so the religion is set forth in three kind of categories. There are the uh, articles of faith, which are the doctrinal creeds in the Koran, okay, in the confession. Uh, the right type of conduct, moral conduct, how you should dress, how you should act and also religious duty, their worship, their style of worship and what they do for prayer and so on and so forth. The fact that they pray uh, facing east five times a day, that they give alms, that they fast during Ramadan and so on and so forth. You know, the, this, this constitutes their worship. So under the section of religious duty of a Muslim is what's called the pilgrimage. And so the pilgrimage is that once in a lifetime, a Muslim or his representative, you can send a representative for your family, a Muslim must go to the holy shrine at Mecca for religious observances, for a pilgrimage going to Mecca. The shrine at Mecca, which is located in Saudi Arabia today, is considered holy for two reasons. First of all, 
Uh, it is the place where the Kaaba, the Kaaba is kept. The Kaaba is a large square building covered by a black silk cloth. It's about four stories high. And inside of it is a meteorite, actually a piece of rock, a meteorite, uh, that fell in the region in the Middle Ages and was considered a sacred sign from Allah, which is the Muslim name for God. And so this black stone is kissed or touched by the pilgrims as they proceed around the building in circular fashion. And you may have seen pictures of this where you have thousands of Muslims you know, moving like waves around this, uh, around this Kaaba. Um, it is also said to be near the place where um, Hagar was lost in the desert with Ishmael, who is the father of the Arab people. So part of the pilgrimage sees them kind of running between two hills and shaking their shoulders seven times in imitation of Hagar, frantic at being lost in the desert. So this, along with prayers and teaching and fasting and almsgiving, make up their religious pilgrimage to Mecca. Another interesting thing about this story is that it reveals to us another type. Remember what I said about types? A type is a person or a place or a thing or a situation that prepares us for a person or place or a thing or a situation that God wants to reveal to us in complete truth. So I gave you many different types. You know, Melchizedek was the type of of priesthood for the priesthood that Christ would have. The ark, if you wish, was a type uh, for the church. Remember, I gave you those examples. You know, the ark only had one, you know, if you, if, uh, everyone who was in the ark was saved. Well, everyone who's in the church is saved. There was only one door to enter into the ark. Well, there's only one door to enter into, he, into the, the church, and that's Jesus Christ, so on and so forth. So I said that in the Bible there are, there are types. Well, this section here presents us with another type. Hagar and her actions don't signify anything for us as Christians, but her relationship with Sarah is a type for another more important and ongoing relationship, and that is the conflicting relationship between the principle of law and the principle of grace and the results of each. Each woman represents one of these ideas, Hagar representing the principle of law and Sarah representing the principle of grace. And um, you can keep your finger there in Genesis, 20, Genesis 21, but we need to go over uh, to uh, Galatians chapter four in order to read about you know, this, this idea of type for Hagar and for Sarah. So we're going to go over there, Galatians chapter four, verse 21, and we're going to read this passage. It says, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, and that bondwoman would be Sarah, uh, Hagar, and one by the free woman, and that woman would be uh, Sarah, of course. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and co corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear, Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at, uh, but, uh, as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. And so let's kind of break this down now and see what Paul is saying concerning 
Hagar and Sarah and how they are, they are types. First of all, he talks about Hagar. And Hagar, he says, is a type for the law and all of her descendants are those who follow the law, right? The Jews and the Muslims and all who try to be saved by the principle of the law, not just the Ten Commandments, but by the idea of perfectionism, by the idea of obeying rules, by the idea of obeying a procedure, a worship style, a sacrifice, a sacrifice style. You know, all of these people are all descendants of Hagar, he says, all right? Um, her descendants are born of the flesh in that they are great and numerous, but not the ones through whom the promise would come. Uh, they're born naturally, right? Hagar was Abraham and Sarah's way of trying to make the promise happen in a natural, fleshly way, okay? When God wanted, wanted it to happen in a supernatural way, when Sarah was beyond childbearing, when, uh, uh, when Abraham was beyond childbearing. Uh, you see what I'm saying? And she was not only beyond childbearing, but she had been barren her whole life. She couldn't even have children, even when she was a young woman. So, the, the, so Isaac is a product of a supernatural, a miraculous, a gracious, a gift, if you wish, to, um, to Abraham and Sarah. So going back to Hagar, he says that her people try to justify themselves with the law. They're the children of the law. And I want to tell you, if you study the Muslim religion, you will see how legalistic it is. I mean, Paul refers to Jews you know, who try to justify themselves by the law. Well, you know, Muslims do exactly the same thing. You have to do the pilgrimage. You have to do this. You have to pray every day. You have, you know, there are things that you must do. You know things that you must do, and if you don't do those things, you, know, you, cannot, you cannot live, you cannot be saved, if you wish. Um, uh, their natural earthly home, Paul says, is Jerusalem, not only for the Muslims, but also for the Jews. Even today, the control of the spot where the temple was, I mean, now there's a, there's a mosque over this, the Dome of the Rock, you know? uh, it, it's, it's over the spot where the original Jewish temple was. And what's going on? Every day you read in the paper the war that's going on between, I mean, do you realize how small a country Israel is? How small the Gaza Strip is? And the West Bank, these are tiny little things. And what are they fighting over? They're fighting over who has a right to claim the city of Jerusalem, just as Paul said here 2,000 years ago. All right, their earthly home, Jerusalem. They began by persecuting the children of the promise, Ishmael persecuting Isaac, and they continue to do so throughout history. I mean, take a look at what's happening to Christians in Iraq these days, Christians in Syria, Christians in these Middle Eastern countries as they're being attacked and persecuted and killed by uh, Muslim extremists. And so uh, they began as slaves, the, the children of, of a slave woman, and they're still slaves of sin today. They're not slaves of people, but they're still slaves of sin and ignorance of the gospel today in the same way. So that's how Paul is describing them. And isn't it uncanny how that description continues to fit quite, uh, quite perfectly, if you wish, quite accurately, uh, even to this day. Then he talks about Sarah. And Sarah represents grace. And her descendants are those who rely on faith in Christ to save them. No pilgrimage, no rules, no you know, a certain thing they have to worship, certain thing they have to eat, and so on and so forth. Her descendants began as a gracious promise that is fulfilled by God's power, not man's nature. See the difference? You know, uh, Ishmael was born you know, because of the normal uh, sexual activity of Abraham and a, and, a, and a woman who was able to have children. Okay? Nothing spectacular about that. Isaac was born in a supernatural condition under the, grace of, under the grace of God. Her descendants, Sarah's descendants, exist because God wanted His promise to be carried by 
her generation. He said, the promise is going to come through Isaac and I'm going to do whatever it has to, that I have to do to make the promise come through Isaac. Her people are justified because they believe in God, not because they obey perfectly God's laws. You know, that's, the co that's the core of Christian faith, right? Justification by faith, not justification by law. The complete opposite of, of Islam. Their temple, uh, the descendants of Sarah, their temple is their bodies and God dwells within them, not in a building. I don't have to go to Saudi Arabia to a ceremony to get in touch with God. The Spirit of God dwells in me already and came to dwell in me on the day of my uh, baptism, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. They've also been persecuted for being God's children. Well, you know, the history, we know the history of Christianity, there's been persecution. Uh, and also they began as free. They continue to live as totally free of condemnation and darkness because they're the children of, of light. So Hagar and Sarah's relationship and what happened to them in their lives and their descendants, these are a type, again, so important this idea, a type that demonstrates the difference between the results of those who live under the law and the results of those who live under grace. So we're going to continue um, in this uh, passage. Verses 22 to 34, I'm not going to read that. Uh, but this section recounts an agreement made between Abimelech the king that originally took his wife and Abraham. Remember that? We, we talked about that in the previous lesson. The king wants a kind of a non-aggression treaty with Abraham and Abraham agrees with the condition that he have the right to a disputed well site. And once this matter is settled, Abraham gives the king seven ewe lambs, signifying the completeness of their agreement and the ownership of the well. Abraham then names the place Beersheba, uh, which means well of the oath or well of the seven. And he returns home in the land of the Philistines and he will live here one day, um, uh, but only when Isaac is grown up and Sarah is gone. So a couple of more, a couple of more lessons that we can draw from uh, our section uh, today, the section that we covered. Uh, lesson number one is we're never too old to sin, are we? You know, I had a professor in college, uh, uh, Dr. Baird, who um, at the time when I was in college was probably, probably in his late 70s. And uh, he once told the class that the type of sin uh, as you get older changes, but it's always a problem for a human being. So the sins of a man who is 20 and the sins of a man who is 75, not exactly the same sins, but sin nevertheless, and sinfulness that needs to be dealt with. Well, Abraham was 100 years old, but his habit of give, lying about his wife to protect himself, you know, this was well ingrained, and it caused him problems even at this late date in his life. The key, of course, is to deal with sinfulness right away and not think that we're going to grow too old to be subject to temptation or to be subject to sin. Or that simple aging leads to holiness. You know, denying sinfulness uh, it, it requires an effort no matter how old you are. You know, just because you're old doesn't mean you automatically uh, are not subject to temptation. So you're never too young to start and you're never too old to stop uh, sinning. Uh, number two lesson, uh, mountaintops always lead to valleys. Mountaintops lead to valleys. You know, people, especially young people, think that life, you know, life starts low and it just gets better and better and better and better all the time. We just evolve you know, better. And of course, that's the evolutionary thinking that is ripe in our society today. But the truth is that we start perfect and then we fall and, and our pattern is, is, is you know, up and down after that. This is especially true in Christian life. Mountaintop experiences are usually followed by valleys of darkness. I mean, look at it. Uh, look at what we've just read you know, in the last couple of chapters. Abraham had been visited by the Lord and angels in person. Then he saved his nephew a second time through his 
uh, through his prayer. Um, he had been rejuvenated to the point where he had, uh, he had a sex life again, was active and productive. He was on top of the world and then he lied about his wife, an old lie, and his life came crashing down, right? So this pattern happens in the church all the time. When things are going really great, there's momentum and growth and great enthusiasm, you can be sure. When that happens, you can be sure that Satan is working overtime to divide the brethren or bring sin into the camp to make things you know, come crashing down. I'm always afraid when the church is going really well, things are moving along, we're growing, people are getting along, you know, and so on and so forth. I'm always very cautious then for something to happen to start creating division and anger among the brethren. So when you're at the peak, you know, my advice is slow down and be cautious because it's easier to fall when you're on the mountaintop than when you're in the valley. Another lesson uh, that uh, I have found from this particular section is that his time, meaning God's time, is not always your time. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times his timing is different than your time. You know, God accomplished everything for Abraham in exactly the time that He said that He would. We need to understand that since God is in charge of everything, even how long or how much Satan can operate, He's also in charge of time. It's not only His time for religious things or prayers, everything runs on His time. Isn't, you know, not just church service, you know, 9.30, 10.30, Wednesday, 7.00, not just church service runs on His time, everything runs on His timetable. The rain, the good, the evil, the beginning, the end, everything's according to the Lord's timetable. Our job is to cultivate an appreciation for His timetable and develop patience. Patience. God always knows how long things will take and how long we have. We get impatient. And one, one, many good things about other religions, I guess, but there is one good thing about uh, Buddhism. Buddhism feels that the, the problem with man is that he wants, he wants things, he's restless. And much of the religion, much of the practice you know, uh, in Buddhism uh, is to dissipate this restlessness within man and this wanting within man. Well, that's, that's not a, a bad idea. Um, uh, within Christianity, uh, we search for the, uh, uh, for the peace that surpasses understanding, same idea. Uh, you know, no more restlessness, no more wanting, no more craving. It's okay to want something, it's to crave it. Okay? And, and I say all of this to say the following. Usually, the reason for our restlessness is that we feel that something should happen by a certain time or we don't have enough time to do something, or we don't have enough time left, or this thing happened too soon or too late. It's always about time. The time about things usually is the thing that creates the pressure, that cranks up the stress, right? If we just understood that God knows the time for everything, everything is under His control, if we just learn to submit to His timetable, uh, we would have a much less stressful life because He never forgets the time and He never is late and He never wastes time, not His time or our time. And He's always aware of the time that we have left. So that's a very comforting, comforting thought. So if we'll become uh, 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 much more aware of how God is in charge of time, we will then become much less stress if we realize that the world operates on God's timetable and not ours. Certainly we as Christians, as believers, should embrace that idea uh, much more than the world embraces that idea. In the world, you know, they're, trying to, they're trying to relegate the time. Uh, we in the Christian world are trying to submit to God's timetable. Okay, well, we're going to stop there for this week. A uh, little information about Sarah and Hagar as types for the grace of God on one side, Sarah, and the process or the, the, uh, the system of law 
if you wish, uh, on the other. All right, we're going to continue uh, next time. I'm glad that you were here, glad that those uh, who are watching on video have uh, selected uh, uh, the Genesis course to take. Hope it, it is edifying for you and encouraging as well. All right, we'll see you next time.